you. Uh, I'm Sammy Amounts. Nice to see you all. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I graduated from Seoul American High School in the year 2000. And I essentially grew up on Yongsan Army Post. My family first moved here in 1989 when I was six. I had just turned six years old. Um, we lived in Chunghua Apartments in Itaewon oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the first six months or so before <laughs> moving on base. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, I know that place. <laughs> um, my first experience in Seoul was to get a mosquito bite underneath my eye that made it swell up so that my eye was closed. And I remember being like, this place is going to suck for me. But it didn't turn out that way. Um, I was here from second all the way through the end of fifth grade. We moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years and then we moved back in the middle of my eighth grade year, which at the time was like the worst thing that oh, could yeah. possibly happen to me. My friends. I was in LA, I had an agent, oh. I was going to auditions, I was being fabulous, I'm a singer actor. And going back to Korea was just like, oh great, so my life is over. <laughs> Came back in the middle of eighth grade year, I was very unhappy about it. I got made fun of a lot. Uh, <laughs> I was a weird kid who liked to read books at lunchtime, uh, but somehow I made it through high school, graduated in 2000, and then in the 17 years since then have realized that I love Seoul more than any other place on earth. And that army base that felt like a prison to me when I was growing up there is now the closest thing to a hometown that I have. Um, and I'm so sad that it's, it's gonna be gone soon. So I'm really happy that you guys are doing this, and I think it's awesome. Uh, I'm here, in addition to being an alumnus of the high school, because I wrote a young adult novel that's set on the base. Uh, apparently, this is the only fiction novel in existence that's set on that base. <laughs> At least in English. Yeah, maybe there's, yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe there's something in Korean. As far as I know, though, this is the only one. Um, I set it on the base because the base was what I knew. I wanted to write something about middle schoolers. Uh, and they say, write what you know. So I did. The base isn't what the, the book is about. It's about these characters and what they go through. And the base is simply the setting. It's mm. not the yeah. central theme. But I did write a little bit about what it felt like to me when I was you know, 11, 12 years old, living, living on that base. Uh, and I wanted to read about it. I read a little excerpt for you guys. Um, so my main character, Taryn Frunk, is an 11-year-old who makes sculptures out of trash, mm. which didn't, doesn't exactly earn her that many admirers in the cruel world of middle school. It's called Frunk the Skunk. So there was a kid at my high school named Chris Orlando. He had a birthmark in the middle of his forehead that caused the hair right there to grow white. And he used to slick his hair back, so it was just a white streak. Um, and I thought that was really cool, so I gave that to my main character, Taryn, which is why it's Frunk the Skunk. Any? It's the way I describe the base in the book is exactly as it was in the mid-90s. Um, I kept the geography exactly the same because they, they added a helipad to the middle of my old neighborhood, which completely changed the, the geography that is described in the book, so I was able to keep it the same. I didn't have to and without, you know. So my main character, Taryn, gets made fun of a lot because she makes sculptures out of trash and she has this weird white streak in her hair um, and her best friend is a super nerd. And uh, I wrote a little bit about how she only has one friend. Uh, so I'm gonna read next. It wasn't that she couldn't make friends. It was just that nobody lived on an army post for longer than a year or two. You made friends and then they left you or you left them, so what was the point? Everything was so temporary when you were a military brat. The only friend Taryn had had for more than a couple of years was her striped gray cat, Effie. Her neighborhood was designed to perfectly replicate a suburban residential area in the United States. It almost succeeded. There were tree-lined sidewalks and cul-de-sacs. There were people jogging and walking big American dogs flown in from the States, of course. <laughs> None of the dogs she'd seen off post in the real Korea were much bigger than her backpack. <laughs> Seoul was, after all, a metropolitan city, much like New York City, where Taryn had once visited some relatives. You couldn't have a big dog in a city that dirty and crowded. But on the army post, or just on post as the kids who lived there said, everything was different. It was like a postage stamp of American suburbia imprinted on the heart of Seoul. The heart of Seoul, thought Taryn. I like it. It rings with irony. 
She found it amusing and a bit sad that at the heart of this great Asian city was a lame American army post, ungrateful breaths. <laughs> All of the houses on her street were duplexes, treated to look like sickly sweet pastel shaded stucco on the outside. But Taryn knew that underneath the fake stucco were ugly cement blocks. You could see them on the interior walls in certain rooms of the houses, which all had the same design. The wall, capital W, was the only thing separating the idyllic military community from the towering city outside. All Taryn had to do was look to her left at any given time to see the wall with its icing of barbed wire. There were dirty gray office buildings on the other side, built so close to the wall that you could probably jump right in onto the base from one of their upper floor windows. But of course, nobody ever did. That was an easy way to get in trouble with the MPs. Taryn forced herself to look straight ahead as she walked. Every time she glanced over the wall, she felt a deep longing to run out of the guarded gates of the army post and into the dangerous city, never to return to her miserable life on this <laughs> miserable base. <laughs> she thought she could be happy in a society where no one knew her where she'd have to learn a new language. And when she did, everyone would be so impressed that she could speak Korean, they wouldn't even notice how strange she was. <laughs> so uh, that's the excerpt I wanted that to read. Good. I yeah. really like that. that was excellent. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to pass this around so you guys can look. Uh, the uh, illustrations are really beautiful. They're by this Italian artist named Luca Matricardi. Page 14 has an illustration of your route to school, which is especially impressive. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. I, the last time we saw yeah. it on Amazon, it was being sold used for $84. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as you can tell from the excerpt, my time as a middle schooler, high schooler on the base was not exactly the happiest, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure many of you can relate to. It's not the happiest time in anyone's life. Um, but, and I talked about the loneliness that you feel when your friends leave you or you leave them. Pretty much every year, it's this whole new social circle. But the lasting effects of that, I've realized as an adult, are that I can make new friends so quickly. Uh, I find it very easy to say goodbye to people because I know it's only a matter of time before I see them again. Uh, and I can adapt to change uh, in a way that I don't, I don't see in a lot of other people who've lived in one place their whole lives um, or who've lived in, a, you know, in places that were just very conventional, I guess you could say. Uh, and I'm really grateful for all of that. I also started working when I was in high school as a voice actor, uh, which has led to my adult career as a voice actor. And the way I've supported myself the entire time I've been out of school has been through voice acting, and I never would have had the foundation for it if it wasn't for living here in Seoul. I still remember that one time I was taking the, the cable car up to Namsan, and the narration was you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Around 2006. Yeah. I don't know if it there. still is now. But. I'm curious. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, but let's talk about uh, what it was like actually growing up on the base. Um, you know, you have, have most of you been on base, I, I assume. You've all lived there, worked there, been there every day. So you know how different it feels from the outside. Um, how they're trying to create this little microcosm of American culture, but the, you know you can tell it's the military, it's kind of <laughs> industrial. Um, as a kid, it, I felt like I was in a prison. I, I always wanted to escape, uh, but now I, I, you know, I think about Camp Adventure. <laughs> Do you guys know about Maybe. Camp Adventure? <laughs> they would bring in these University of Iowa college students to run this summer camp for all of the base kids every summer. Uh, they would do day camps uh, right on the base, and they would do sleepaway camps in Daegu or Busan, uh, or we'd get driven to K-16 uh, every morning and brought back every evening. Uh, <laughs> Camp Adventure was so wonderful. We sang the stupidest songs. <laughs> they taught us how to swim. We did crafts. I don't know. I loved it. Um, I think about how there weren't enough there weren't enough kids when I was going to school there for there to be an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. So elementary was K through six, high school was seven through 12. Uh, <laughs> and you just felt, I don't know, it felt like there was less of a hierarchy than in every other place I've ever been in school. People just kind of felt like they were all in it together. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be friends with seniors when you were a freshman, mm -hmm. I was. Um, we got to go to Japan and Guam and other parts of Korea for Far East 
competitions and festivals. I used to do Far East drama and Far East music and model United Nations. Um, and I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but like when my friends in the States are like, oh yeah, we'd go to Allstate in like the neighboring town. I'm like, well, I would go to Far East Music yeah. Festival in Okinawa. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was so much adventure. There, was, there were so many places to travel to that were so interesting when you got to live in the heart of Asia. Yeah. Uh, I'm addicted to this city at this point. I can't stop coming back. I love it here so, so much. Um, and I've also been affected deeply by Korean culture in ways I never anticipated. There were cliques within the school, but I don't remember them being, they may have been economically based. I remember there being the super Christian clique, <laughs> um, the loser kids clique. <laughs> and then there were like, they were like the smart kids who got all the really great grades. Um, usually they were like sort of on the outside of the Christian clique. Uh, and then there was a, there was a clique of uh, Korean American, like half Korean kids that hung out a lot with each other. Um, and this is, this is really bad, but we used to call them the gangster clique because they were mean. <laughs> <laughs> they were mean. <laughs> I got beat up by them once when I was in the loser clique. So like my sophomore year of high school, I wanted to, I got really sad, I wanted to rebel, so I started wearing all black and I found out that there was this thing called gothic subculture oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the internet, which yeah. was new at the time. Yeah. And it was like 1997, 96, 97, something like that. Um, 98, I don't know, something, somewhere around there. And uh, so I decided I would be gothic. So I started dressing all in black, doing this crazy makeup. I would powder my face with talcum powder. I dyed my hair black. <laughs> and I showed up at school like that one day and everybody was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that year I started hanging out with the, the like loser kids. But one of the loser kids was the son of, do you remember Andrew Christensen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was this brilliant kid who was the son of one of the embassy cats and like his family was yeah, so I don't think the cliques were economically based. Mm. Um, it, was, it was more about your interests. <laughs> and right. our interests were chugging cough syrup in the park in the middle of the night. So, <laughs> the, <Your identity. laughs> uh. so that led to my, my mother, who was a teacher at the high school. Uh, she reported two of the kids that I hung out with. Their, she reported their mom for child neglect. Oh, their mom really? Was constantly hanging out with some GI she was dating, she was never home. And she got the whole family deported and everybody blamed me and I got kicked out so then I joined the Christian clique. I had a secret best friend who was a cheerleader um, that whole year that I was goth and we would get together and play Donkey Kong, uh, or no, Mario Kart. <laughs> Mario Kart and Donkey Kong at her place after school and nobody knew we were friends. So when I got kicked out of the loser group, um, she let me join the Christian group. <laughs> Next year. I started wearing yellow. We had we had a lot of Korean students and a lot a lot of half Korean mm -hmm. students. Yeah. Um, so you know, automatically there you've got, and also we had a lot of Korean uh, employees of the school, I see. teachers, yeah. um, and other staff, uh, as well as tons and tons of Korean employees on the base. Mm -hmm. So you were surrounded by sort of this different way of approaching people uh, and communicating that was a lot more mm -hmm. polite um, than you're used to in American culture and also a little bit a little bit more formal a lot of mm -hmm. the times uh, when I started working as a voice actor in high school I was getting picked up at the gate by my agent uh, and just he would drive me to my jobs which were at studios all over the city so I was working with Korean audio engineers mm -hmm. and directors and clients all the time. And again, this, there's a lot of stuff that at the time I was living it, I didn't see it for how great it was. Yeah. Now, I, now I'm like, God, I learned so much. I got so much out of it. But at the time, I didn't think I was getting anything yeah. out of it. Um, for me, what it did was it gave me a perspective on humanity mm -hmm. that I don't see in a lot of Americans who grew up in America the whole time. Um, this idea of being a citizen of the world, 